Welcome back to this I-24 News uh, Evening Edition. I'm Lucy Arisha, and this is The Daily Debate. Tonight uh, and today marks the two-year anniversary since the death of former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. Joining me uh, tonight is Dr. Danielle Shuftan, the director of the National Security Studies Center at Haifa University and visiting professor at Georgetown University. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. And as well as Mr. Ali Wakid, I-24 News Middle East Analyst. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So before we were talking about the day after Muammar Gaddafi was killed, let's uh, say the word, uh, what was Libya, how did Libya look like a day before? Ali. Well, Libya looked like uh, most of the Arab uh, countries, a country that was uh, led and directed by a family, by a dictator who tried to cover his dictatorship uh, uh, by some uh, Republican uh, symbols like d direct uh, uh, democracy. But of course, all the power was concentrated in the hands of um, his family, his sons. But ironically, this situation uh, uh, did guarantee um, big, uh, big uh, stability and a large uh, possibility to the uh, Libyan uh, people uh, at least to work and to feel uh, safe, which we cannot say that this is the situation right now. Uh, officially, we have a democracy, but on the ground, we have a total anarchy. So like you said, a total anarchy. But how did the people, it was stability on the ground, but actually the people didn't feel like a very stable situation and they felt very deceived by the government, by Muammar Gaddafi. I think we're trying to apply to Libya criteria that are not at all relevant to Libya. What you have in Libya is a tribal society. What The only thing that matters to people is if their tribe, their family, their kinsmen are in power or not. And if they have the power, they misuse it, they abuse it vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other elements. So the entire approach of saying, here is a state, this is the regime of a state, so let's see what we can do about it, is the wrong approach. The Europeans came to Libya, overthrew Gaddafi, because without outside help, the rebels could not have done it. And they expected some democracy in Libya. And you have to have a very developed sense of humor to even use the term democracy in the Middle East in general and in Libya in particular. So what you get is one kind of anarchy substituting another kind of dictatorship. So the only question is, do you have one person who kills everybody else, or do you have everybody killing everybody, everybody else? else? But uh, uh, Ali, what do you think? Do you think that it's a problem in the cultural that doesn't, the culture that doesn't understand democracy, that it's not prepared for democracy, that the people are not actually living by a democracy, so they don't know what a democracy is? Lucy, we're not even there. This is a tribe rule. Everybody, like uh, Professor said, is making the calculations according to the interest of his uh, of his tribe. Uh, uh, during the uh, the period before Gaddafi uh, was assassinated, we thought that uh, this is an issue between uh, Benghazi and and uh, Tripoli. But when we see that even the tribe of Muammar Gaddafi is succeeding to concentrate around it, uh, some supporters of among those who, uh, uh, who who fought Gaddafi uh, two years uh, two years ago, we can see that the only calculations on the ground are the tribe calculations. What is the percentage in power of uh, my tribe of my organization? But there is a large number of uh, organization at the election thirty. Uh, um, uh, different groups presented themselves uh, to the election, more than 600 candidates, uh, most of them uh, representing uh, tribes, were represented in the, uh, in the election, but those still the uh, tribe element, the uh, tribe calculations are the calculations that prevent Libya from uh, reaching, uh, from bringing all the different uh, players around one table and discussing the future of this nation, which I doubt if we can define it as a nation. Dr. Shiftan, how do you discuss a future with tribes 
of a nation that it's not used to sit down on a negotiation table and actually discuss things. You simply don't come with expectations that are totally unrealistic. The problem is that we come with these expectations. Look, in the Middle East, there are only four real countries, or three and a half real countries. Iran, Turkey, Israel, and to some extent, Egypt. The rest are tribal societies. I mean, look at Syria. In Syria, again, you have the same situation. You either have the Assads killing everybody else or everybody killing everybody else. And if you ask me about the future of Syria, I don't see any kind of future that can be hopeful for the Syrian people in the foreseeable future. Look at Iraq, look at Yemen, look at uh, Sudan, look at, look at Lebanon, look at the whole Middle East. You have here a hopeless region, a failing region. It's not just a failed state, it's a failing region. Now, from, for us as Israelis, this is not a good thing. I mean, Egypt hopeless, Egypt going hungry is a bad thing. Living in an area that is inherently unstable is a very bad thing. But you have to be realistic. If you look at it from Washington or from Paris or from London, and you speak about nations and coalition and opposition and the judiciary and so on, they're not only coming from a different planet, they're coming from a different galaxy. Okay, so uh, we are, I want to ask you a personal question. As we are both Arabs, we're looking at the situation in the Middle East and for me, it's always surprising to see how Arabs are actually slaughtering their own selves because this is something that we cannot see in Western societies, not based on a religious uh, thing. Well, at least we saw it at World War II. I would say two things. Uh, first, I want to react to what the, the professor said. He said that we have three and a half uh, nations. I thought that Libya was the fourth and a half uh, nation because Libya there is one religion, but and I thought that the tribes would uh, would uh, try to view another future beyond the the uh, tribe interests because all, most of them are Sunnis, most of them are uh, Arabs. We don't have even like we have in Algeria and in Morocco the Berbers, but unfortunately uh, the uh, tribe element. The the tribe interest was the was the winning as uh, um, as far f for the the Arabs in general I uh, I do tell everybody that quarter of an hour after the death of Prophet Muhammad the struggles the internal struggles started even among those who call, who are called the holiest uh, person and I said two of the caliphs were assassinated in internal uh, in internal uh, fight so it is true that the uh, Arab population the Muslim uh, population must view must have a, a, a different vision of shura of democracy of consultation because the um, the Western vision for sure does not fit the Middle East How does not not you fit our, our How do you educate the society, the Arab society, that for something different, for not to kill, to take Gaddafi, for example, not to kill him in, in front of everybody, but to take him to justice, to take him to court, to make him pay for what he did, but in a more legal way than to actually slaughter him in the street? Apparently, the Jahiliya laws didn't totally disappear with Islam and after Islam we still have many of the uh, Jahiliya laws and uh, and rules and although uh, Islam uh, spoke about respecting uh, differences still some of this uh, some of this uh, rule the use of, of violence is still very uh, dominant in the Arab and in the uh, Muslim uh, societies and just to give uh, speaking Libya many of the uh, parties who are now in internal struggles are Islamic uh, uh, parties we have different Islamic groups and if we if we uh, see who is supporting the different groups in Gaza, you see different groups in Libya, one sending uh, uh, arms to Hamas, the other sending to the Islamic Jihad, and the third is sending arms to the Jihadiyya uh, Salafiyya groups in the, uh, in the Gaza Strip. 
And um, I think that what was not uh, solved in uh, 1400 uh, centuries cannot be uh, solved because a couple of millions of people went out in the streets in, in Tunisia or in Egypt or in, uh, or in Libya, uh, 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 very deep process of education must be started. But when you say a very deep process of uh, education, you ask with whom to start, where to start, who is uh, guiding the schools in, in Libya, for example, who is at the head of the Ministry of Education uh, uh, in Libya. Is he able, is he capable to put aside all the uh, uh, tribe influence, all his tribe I tribal identity, and to think a, Lib a new Libyan identity? This lack of, uh, of education is not only in Islam, but you said something about the Western society that came and said, now you should have a democracy, and now you should learn how democracy works. And this is, a, I, I heard a kind of, um, that you're saying basically that the West is patronizing, and the West doesn't understand a lot, and doesn't understand maybe anything about the Arab society. Very little, but let me start uh, somewhat earlier because you speak so much about education. Education doesn't produce anything. The question is what are the values of a society and what is the culture of the society? The Nazis in Germany were very educated. Some of the most radical people in Hamas, some of the most radical people in the global jihad are personally very educated people. The point is not you put somebody in school and then he comes up and he's an engineer or he's a, he is a PhD and then he's educated and then he will not slaughter his, his brother. The point is not education. The point is values. The point is culture. The problem with the Arab world, which by, I believe, by the way, does not not extend to all of Islam and not even to all Arabs is one of pluralism. There is very little pluralism. The idea of live and let live, there is very little of it in the Arab world. But Islam can produce also a functioning system as we've seen in Turkey for a long time until Erdogan came. Uh, in Iran, we have a society, you get rid of this particular regime, the Iranian society is a healthy society. You go to Bangladesh, you have four times in, um, free elections in, Bal in Bangladesh. You go to Indonesia, 250 million Muslims, and they're far less radicals than what you have in the Arab world. And even in the Arab world, you have people who are trying, and trying very hard. But the point is that you cannot come to a society and say, let's put you in schools, let's give you a curriculum that says democracy, democracy, and you will come out Democrats. It starts with things like the standing of the woman. In, in an Arab society. If you can't deal with your daughters and your sons in an equal way, how can you be expected to deal with it politically with different uh, approaches? So I'm not saying there is no hope. What I'm saying is don't try to believe that by doing something technical, you will change a culture. Cultures can change. And we have seen cultures changing, but it's a very long process, and the Western approach to it was very simplistic. Ali, um, we are hearing what uh, what Professor Shiftan and uh, Dr. Shiftan is uh, saying, and um, you know, I'm thinking, and I'm seeing the footages in uh, in uh, Syria, and we saw the footages in Libya, and what happened to Muammar Gaddafi, and one cannot think if the end of uh, of the Syrian president. Bashar al-Assad will be the same as the end of Muammar Gaddafi? I don't think it would be uh, the same end because uh, Assad has what Gaddafi didn't has. Assad have uh, big minorities that are still uh, supporting him, the Alawite minority, most of the Druze and most of the Christians mm -hmm. uh, uh, are supporting uh, Assad, which we cannot, uh, uh, which we couldn't say about uh, Gaddafi. And Assad is, uh, for the moment, succeeding to play the game among the Sunni even uh, population, and he has large number of the uh, wealthy part of the uh, Sunni population uh, in Syria still uh, supporting him. The, his chief of staff is a Sunni one. Um, the uh, deputy. The uh, uh, president is is uh, Sunni, and Assad is knowing how to uh, play the game of 
tribes and different group religions, both in Syria and in the in the region. And we saw how the card of the two uh, um, the two pilots, the two uh, Turkish pilots, succeeded to put an end to a story okay. of a kidnapping of X number of uh, soldiers in like uh, three four days. In no doubt, the Syrian uh, the Syrian story is uh, very interesting, and it's going to keep on being interesting in the next uh, few weeks months. Who knows? Uh, Ali Waqid, thank you very much uh, for being with us. And Dr. Daniel Shiftan, thank you very much for coming to the studio. We're going out for a small break, 10 minutes break, an update from our news desk. And then we're coming back for the I-24 News one-on-one. -on -one. Don't go anywhere. I'll be here.